and welcome to another MCC live webinar. This one called Give Us Our Daily Bread, COVID-19 and the Coming Food Crisis. Thank you for joining us. This is our fourth MCC webinar, a behind the scenes look at MCC's work. Uh, we have people joining us through Zoom and also via Facebook Live from multiple countries. We are so glad you joined us. Thank you. Warm greetings to you all. And thank you for your ongoing support for MCC, your interest in our work. We're just thrilled that you're part of the MCC story and thrilled that, that we can give you this unique view of the way we serve together in the name of Christ. My name is Rick Koberbaumann, and it is a privilege to serve as the director of MCC Canada. Today, I'm your host. I'm here, and thank you to my dear colleague, Laura Kalmar, for picking out the bow tie for today, which I think actually matches MCC's teal color. So thank you, Laura. I'm coming to you from uh, the little hamlet of Shakespeare outside uh, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. So a few logistics to get us started here. Uh, we will keep you muted throughout the seminar, but if you'd like to submit a question, if you're on Zoom, you can do that through the Q&A function. You can find that, you've probably heard this explanation a few times, in the black toolbar at the bottom of your screen when you move your mouse, you'll find the Q&A function. And if you've joined us via Facebook, uh, we're encouraging you to submit questions too through the Facebook comments section. We'll be monitoring those uh, during the hour. Send the questions anytime, including right now, and uh, we'll keep track of those and try to answer just as many as we can. We won't deal with questions though, probably till near the end and uh, they'll be moderated. And as I said, we'll try to get to just as many as we can. We are recording this session. So if um, you want to have a look again or share it with a friend, it will be made public uh, after the live presentation. So now a few words about today. Give us our daily bread, COVID-19 and the coming food crisis. The United Nations has said that the world is facing perhaps its largest food crisis in 50 years. Today, we're going to hear more about how a health pandemic has turned into a global food crisis. And we're also going to hear a bit about how you are providing help and hope to some of the most vulnerable through MCC's food project. Today's presenters are MCC representatives from South Sudan and Sudan, Amos uh, and Olivia. And we'll also hear from our MCC area directors from Southern Africa, Thelma and Pugani. We're going to invite them to speak for about 20 minutes or so. And then we'll have a good half hour uh, for questions and, and commentary. We're trying to keep this quite informal. And uh, so sometimes one or two, maybe all four will answer some questions. Your questions might be directed at a particular person. Feel free to do that. But we want to have a conversation here where you feel uh, drawn into and, and truly part of MCC's work. So a little bit more about our presenters. Uh, Amos Okelo and Olivia Amoding are our co country representatives for MCC South Sudan. Uh, they've been with MCC for uh, almost seven years, uh, have two children. Um, they are Rena and Ryan. One of them has a birthday coming up very shortly. And Amos is based in Juba, South Sudan, while Olivia and the children are based in Uganda. And just a comment about Olivia. Uh, first of all, Olivia, you share uh, a great grandmother's name uh, with my family. And uh, so that's a fond connection. But um, Olivia sends a note that she can remember individuals for decades by their smiles. So um, I'll try to keep my smile on today, Olivia. And then um, Thelma and Pugani, they are our co-directors for Southern Africa. They are originally from Zimbabwe and are currently coming to you from Winnipeg, where they are presently stationed. So I want to go now to Amos and Olivia to begin our podcast. And then at the very end, we'll tell you a little more about podcasts that are coming up in the future. So again, welcome and special welcome now to Amos and Olivia, our first presenters. Thank you so much uh, for introducing us. And uh, while we are reps, country reps for both South Sudan and Sudan, our presentation will mainly focus on uh, South Sudan. 
and uh, I will go straight to uh, share my screen. So we'll uh, take you through um, the context of, of South Sudan. And um, in the first photo, as you uh, can rightly see, is a map of Africa showing a uh, location of South Sudan in the North uh, Eastern Africa. And uh, as you may already know, South Sudan got its independence in 2011 and is currently the world's newest nation. However, the photo below it um, is a map that is showing an internally displaced uh, people's camp. That's um, typical of most of the camp settings in, in South Sudan. South Sudan has also been embroiled um, in war, in a civil war for the last seven out of its nine years of existence. And as a result, seven for it, uh, five million people out of the current estimated population of around 11.8 million people are in need. And the war has resulted to massive uh, displacements where up to 2.26 uh, million uh, refugees, 1.6 uh, uh, internally displaced, and uh, up to 182,000 are currently still residing in the UN protection of civilian camps. UNICEF also estimates that 2.2 million children uh, across South Sudan are currently out of school, and uh, by February 2020, uh, the Integrated Food Security Face Classification report indicated that more than half of the population in South Sudan, and that is up to around 6 million people, were facing crisis with uh, food insecurity even before the pandemic hit. South Sudan is currently rated uh, 186 out of the 189 countries on the Human Development Index. Which, is, which are key indicators of uh, low life expectancy, limited access to education, and low gross uh, national income per capita for standard of living, among other things. So the post-conflict recovery um, has just started, and uh, we know that it will be quite challenging. In terms of the health, um, Olive is going to take us through. Olivia, you're still muted. Can you unmute yourself, Olivia? There we go. Thank you. Hello. In South Sudan, it's the children who are mainly affected health-wise. There are many of them are malnourished, and most of them are not able to access the immunization at an early age. So you find many of them grew up with polio, they're heavily affected by polio, children in South Sudan. Then also um, the doctors are, are really very, are not very many. So per, per, per one person in South Sudan, it's approximately According to the World Health Organization, it's about 65,000 people per one doctor in South Sudan. Then also, um, during the, we, we, by the time the COVID pandemic broke out in April, it was ap approx approximately, um, but it, it, there were only four, four ventilators that were available in the country. And yet, really, ventilators are very important for the COVID pandemic. Yeah, and uh, just to add, nearly 1.3 million children aged between uh, 6 to 59 months are uh, currently acutely malnourished, uh, as Olivia started, and up to 22% of the health facilities are. Uh, only up to 22% of the health facilities are fully functional. 
However, um, in South Sudan, COVID-19 transcends uh, beyond health crisis and has touched other areas that are critical to people's survival. And uh, key among those areas is the food. And uh, we're going to look at some of the most critical factors, especially impacting the food uh, supply chain and that I envisage to convert the current health crisis into a food crisis and contributing to our topic today, which is uh, give us a daily uh, bread and uh, looking at COVID becoming a food crisis. So in that, um, in that photo, we will reflect on the impact on uh, peace and stability And uh, first and foremost, the uh, COVID delayed uh, the implementation of the 2018 signed peace agreement, which was long awaited to address conflict and uh, security in the country, and uh, which was envisaged to enable people to return to their homes and concentrate on productive activities. The government of national unity uh, was scheduled to be formed in February. However, when COVID restrictions started, only vice presidents ministers were appointed, the formation of state governments was uh, abandoned and suspended at that time, leaving a big uh, governance uh, vacuum. In fact, uh, three out of the five vice presidents tested positive for COVID, and thus they all went into hibernation, rendering the government system uh, virtually non-functional. So with the leadership gap, localized uh, international uh, intercommunal conflicts, revenge attacks, cut rates increased, the joint training of soldiers and rebels assembled was suspended and those assembled left their camps. Uh, violations of the cessation of hostilities agreement between the government and holdout groups in parts of South Sudan became quite dominant and all these are causing constant displacements um, and interacting food production uh, patterns. So the delayed uh, peace implementation uh, means delayed return of refugees and IDPs to their communities, besides the ones who returned before COVID-19 lockdown, who just changed their status you know, from returning as refugees to becoming IDPs, and they have all not been able to return home uh, fully. And also this has delayed the exit of people who are trapped currently in the UN protection of civilian sites. So the lack of peace um, means the continued stay in camps, loss of lives in the communities, loss of household assets, and disruptions to trade flows due to some roadblocks, difficulties in food assistance delivery, and disruptions to the first season uh, cultivation. This is also uh, envisaged to cause cycles of, you know, where no farmers are working, no food, and in turn, which results to no peace. And uh, also affects the work and planning because the needs will continue to grow. Uh, the safety of our staff and partners and the beneficiaries will equally continue to be affected. And this affects uh, a lot of the production work, especially in agriculture. Um, secondly, we, we also realized that COVID affected and uh, mainly retarded the fight against desert locusts in the fashion in the country. Uh, swarms of desert locusts entered South Sudan in February, uh, and uh, even before the first case of COVID was com uh, confirmed in the country. We have physically seen uh, some of the locusts. So the locust invasion is estimated as um, East Africa's worst locust plague in 70 years and the worst in 30 years for South Sudan. Uh, the desert locusts are considered the most destructive migratory pests, and according to the UN, UN uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, you know, an average of um, an average swamp can destroy crops sufficient to feed 2,500 people per year, and they eat equivalent of their own weight body weight in food uh, every day. And are currently breeding so fast that numbers are estimated to grow probably five times by, uh, by the end of uh, this period. 
So although some of the donors have uh, given some funds and are also given by February, that were required for the desert locals' response, uh, COVID-19 movement restrictions impeded uh, operational capacity, affecting dissemination of awareness messages, and also slowed the procurement of uh, most pesticides. Uh, for example, uh, it was reported that around the around April, the plans for aerial spraying were delayed due to mandatory 14-day quarantine for the incoming foreign pilot, as well as difficulties procuring supplies associated with freight shipping delays uh, due to COVID-19 and, and the ban on flights. So the locusts have been producing and are expected to hatch new brand of locusts soon. Local farmers have uh, resorted, some of them have been reported to be trying to set fires and make noise to attempt to, to ward off the locals. But this is, is, is quite temporal. So the issue is the locals are consuming crops in the emergence and vegetative stages. And this will lead to crop losses and failed harvest. And they're also consuming pasture for, for animal grazing in the areas that are currently affected. Thus, the locals are playing, you know, plus the COVID epidemic are highly predicted to affect livelihoods and will continue to uh, cause catastrophic uh, levels of uh, food security in the coming month and or that will go into the year. The other area that uh, is currently affected in, in the South Sudan is that uh, COVID has affected the coping mechanisms of uh, some of the vulnerable households, for example, like IDPs. And uh, with the continuous uh, stay in the camps, uh, recurring food insecurity and inability, inability to carry out their farming for their own food production and the lack of income earning opportunities the inability to meet their daily nutritional you know, requirements. The most uh, internally displaced people uh, current mostly depend on uh, the nature-based resources for coping and, and survival. So the movement outside of the camps and the protection of civilian people camps that have been quite restricted due uh, to distant areas and gathering restrictions due to COVID have in addition uh, to other ongoing challenges like insecurity they affected especially households' ability to access um, and to travel to search for firewood for sale, which, you know, where they get their resources. It has also affected the ability to move to distant places uh, to be able to search for wild fruits, game meat, and uh, other different forms of casual labor, which have been there very uh, key source of you know survival and coping and uh, some of the wild fruits like the one you see the first on the first photo uh, for example tamarind uh, provides it's uh, believed to provide uh, for example magnesium calcium iron and other food nutrients so all of these nutrients and desired food have really drastically been reduced uh, due to covid so the reduced coping uh, strategies uh, mean that people will now mainly look to humanitarian agencies such as uh, MCC to provide needed support for their survival and continues to really broaden their vulnerability. Um, and also in the absence of such support, uh, especially about food security, then we are expecting that the food insecurity levels will rise uh, malnutrition levels will equally rise, and indeed uh, the prayers for minimum of daily bread will indeed continue to, to, to feature daily. Um, the other area that has been uh, equally affected is uh, the impact of uh, COVID on the businesses, farming, and the aspects of the rural economies, for example, um, the cereal deposits make up a significant uh, proportion of the calories consumed in South Sudan. Um, but import volumes were reported to have fallen up to around 50% by April uh, due to movement restrictions and difficulties of doing business uh, during that period. This has affected supplies for small uh, 
businesses such as you know, second and colonies that were actually fully banned and other uh, smaller businesses just was affected timely supply of even seeds for planting and also increased the prices of communities. So due to the movement restrictions and mandatory you know, business closures in non-food sectors, you know, household income from casual labor and pet trade has reduced and it is really envisaged to, to fall even further and below the normal that has always uh, been in the previous uh, times, especially in urban areas. So this coupled with um, high food prices um, and household purchasing power and savings are expected to decline. And this is most likely uh, to be followed by a reduction in food supply and demand uh, due to reduced purchasing power. And the households will automatically shift and some of them are actually shifted to less expensive and less nutritious foods uh, that have already been uh, observed, especially in areas where some of our partners are working. As households you know, try to make uh, most of their income and savings that they're left with. Some of the rural household income from livestock sales uh, is also expected to lower further due to suspension of livestock uh, auction markets. Uh, based on restrictions on, on the social gatherings. And uh, generally, the, volati the, the, the volatile uh, food prices, you know, have continued to, to you know, to rise in, in a number of countries, in a number of uh, places in the country. And this has also affected the cost of uh, imported farm equipment. And uh, this has been reported to, you know, to have affected the amount of seeds and tools that farming communities can acquire for planting, including for uh, some of our beneficiaries. And, and thus, uh, even for those who are able to plant, um, they will not be able to plant and harvest enough to take them through to the next year. So the movement constraints um, also affect affected and it's continuing to affect the humanitarian seed distributions. And this is in turn expected to lower further uh, the 2020 acreage planted and subsequently the earnings from, from agriculture. And this will uh, continue to add on to challenges of accessing food and will contribute to uh, definitely food crisis in the subsequent in, in month and also next year. Amos, this other... is Rick. Sorry, Amos, I'm just going to chime in and do a time check here and see if we can uh, get you to wrap up shortly so we can also hear from our other presenters. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Amos. <clears throat> the other area that is uh, uh, affected is especially the food assistance delivery, where it has been quite it's generally you know, stated that overall operation capacity to procure and distribute food assistance will somehow decline in this period. It has already affected us as MCC uh, because uh, our food delay to reach by close to around uh, two months because the UN flights that we use have uh, been quite challenging to, to get, but also the access uh, to these areas by a road has been very challenging, um, especially uh, for the local trucks because of the setting in of the the rain. So the continuing delays means that uh, immediate hunger, malnutrition, and up relapse to family conditions are anticipated to, to resurface. So for the second slide, uh, Olivia will uh, join in to take us through some of the... Olivia, you're still muted. Um, and I wonder if we can and do this in a, a, a few minutes, maybe two minutes or so, Olivia, so that we also make sure we have a chance for Thelma and Pugani. Okay. Um, yeah, you. I'm going to speak briefly about the impact of COVID on long-term access to production, to production processes as it affects social laws on inheritance, ownership, and care of surviving vulnerable groups. A rapid assessment by our partner web, that is a women's empowerment program, indicated that it's the women who are more, more worried about the government declarations on COVID, 
on COVID, especially on restrictions or restriction on gatherings, um, uh, in, which includes not covering for barriers in South Sudan. Barriers are really a very big thing, especially for the widows, because in most communities that we work with, it's in the burial ceremonies that that the women and the, and the children are given a maybe short the inheritance. So it's it's when your husband dies, you're not sure if you'll be accepted in the family or sent away with your children. So this this the the barriers are really critical that after the meetings that are held determine the position of the widow in the home. So that's the time when she's given high in inheritance, maybe land that she owns with her children, the cattle, and whatever property that the clan wishes to give her from her husband. From her husband. So you find now uh, the uh, abolishing of, of the barriers means maybe the families are able to do that and the meetings may never be held. So that's why the women are kind of worried about that. Then also many women, many women are widowed because of their, their husbands being recruited into war. So you find up to right now, food assistance, MCC's, MCC's food assistance is going up to 60% of women who are, who are women-headed families. So a case in point is, is, is Nanyong, who is a 30-year-old, who, who has benefited from this. And also they express their fear that when, when the COVID-19, when, when, when they contract COVID-19, they don't know the fate of their children, especially those who, ha who have given birth to children in camps and they're not known by the wider family. So they think their children will, will maybe just end up wandering off and becoming outcasts. Then also um, some, some, some ladies have, 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 been, have been rejected in their families. And a case in point is a lady, a, a case in point is, is Charity, who was rejected by, by, by her husband. She was sent away by her husband and she could also not go back to her family. So she, was, she kept wandering, in, she was wandering in, in Juba town because in South Sudan and most of the African cultures, when you get married, you're married, there's no turning back because the husband brought in, the, brought in the dowry and you coming back home means that they'll come back and claim for the dowry. So she came back, she was in, she was in Juba town. She, then she was identified by one of our, our partners, the, um, the Women's Empowerment Program. She was trained in tailoring. She, she, she given, given, given a tailoring machine and, and something to start a business. She's financially, she's steady, but her worry is that if she, if she contracts COVID-19, that what would happen to her three daughters after that? Since, since her husband's home does not recognize her, and neither does, and neither does her family. So that is the case, but um, through the MCC, MCC assistance, food assistance, hope is restored to some because we are, we are able to give, we are able to give food, food items like salt, sorghum, um, beans and cooking oil which has really helped to, to improve on feeding in families and, and saving lives. So you find at least families, some families that MCC is supporting are assured of at least two meals a day. So, and also the, at least they, they are having balanced dieties and also has, 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 has greatly reduced the, the rate of malnutrition in the household currently. MCC is providing food ratios of 550, 522 to 522 households in, Pari, in, Pariang, in Pariangkab. A case in point, as a wrap up, is a lady called Nanyong. She, she, she became widowed and lost, and lost all her family members when there, was, when there was a conflict in her village. She was survived by just one son. So she escaped to Parian camp of internally displaced people where she found refuge with her son. She, she was grateful to her son because he, he fended for her. So at least she says that was, at, that, 
she, she says he was her source of hope, but unfortunately, the son fell sick, fell sick and died suddenly, and that wasn't her situation. Like she was, she was in so much grief. By the time she met the MCC partner staff that works in Parian camp, so through that she was able to, she was she she, she was recruited into, into the program, and she got food. And in her own words, she, she was she, she was really very. She was very thankful for what MCC had done through the partner. And she, in her words, she said that elder, elderly women are fed by their children or grandchildren, but the world has deprived, has deprived me of, of mine. I buried them in the ground. Please help me so I won't die. That was, that's what, those, those were her, her words to our partner staff, Patrick. And when she was recruited into the program, her words of thank you was where God has answered my prayers. He's, he's sent you to rescue me while holding her hands to her chest. She said, I am so thankful to all who have provided this support. So generally as MCC South Sudan, we are grateful for, for your support to us because this is a camp that is not recognized by the United Nations as a fully fledged camp for internal, inter, internally displaced people and does not receive mandatory support from the UN agencies. So without your gift, people like Nyampu would have very few options. We are really grateful. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Amos, for uh, that was just a remarkable window into South Sudan, a, a place that uh, many of us simply don't have a lot of visibility into. Um, and I really appreciated, Olivia, your closing words there with uh, passing on thanks to the people that are listening here today, because uh, it's not only a window, but it's, it's an actual place of exchange. And you've helped us see them to that so, so effectively. Thank you. Um, we will be back with some, some questions. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, Thelma and Tugeni, you're going to give, a, I think, a short presentation uh, as well, and then we'll, we'll open it up for some questions. So Thelma, Tugeni, please, let's go to you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us this opportunity to share with you just a little bit more information about how MCC is responding uh, to this COVID crisis and uh, what mechanisms MCC is putting in place to ensure that we help our communities and we help those people that are vulnerable in ways that can protect and safeguard them from the impacts of COVID. Uh, we will share our PowerPoint and uh, just give you a brief uh, presentation of what is going on uh, in the programs. Okay. So um, the first thing that we wanted to just say that uh, we are celebrating our 100th birthday as MCC. And thank you so much for your support. And thank you so much for the continued prayers and thoughts and best wishes for MCC as it continues to change and uh, make a difference in the world. MCC is currently working on finding new ways of emphasizing partner staff and community protection and all the work that we do. You will see in the picture on the top, we have our partner staff with a banner on information on pre coronavirus prevention in the community. And in the middle, our partners in a meeting outside exercising social distancing. Protection that MCC is working on is protection from COVID, protection from domestic violence, and also protection from food insecurity. You see in the bottom picture, our partner staff with the police and the prison service working together with MCC in collaborating 
on addressing protection issues. And just as Amos and Olivia said, one of the biggest challenges is food and delivering food aid has been a challenge. Traditionally, or before COVID, MCC would present food packages to communities that are food insecure uh, in ways that were faster and more efficient. Communities would come together, stand in lines, as you can see on the picture that is uh, up on top, where women are standing close to each other with a body conduct. People will be chatting, singing songs, dancing, hugging each other and praising their God. Be thankful for the presence and gifts that you are generously giving to MCC and the gifts that there's so much need, as Amos and Olivia were saying. However, because of the COVID pandemic, it's no longer business as usual. People are now coming in smaller groups, social distancing, wearing masks, and all our staff, all our partner staff do have to put on masks during distributions. We also have come up with guidelines on how to work in refugee settings where people are so close to each other. As Selene has already said, as part of the new guidelines that we have for working together, we're no longer coming together in big groups. Before COVID hit, farmers would gather in large groups to help each other work in the field. But now uh, with COVID, we're encouraging families to work together or in farmer groups of less than eight. Yes. And of course, food solutions have to involve growing the food. But at the same time, for you to be able to grow the food in a world where climate change is changing everything, farmers need access to information. How do you ensure that people have access to information when in actual fact, the COVID pandemic has meant that there are government lockdowns, there are restrictions on how people come together. Africans in general, particularly in Zimbabwe, where I come from, people like storytelling. They like to gather in groups. They like to share their stories through stories, through dance, through songs. Now, with this COVID pandemic, it's no longer business as usual. MCC is coming up with new ways of reaching out and saving these vulnerable people through use of technology. Two ways that MCC has implemented successfully involves use of cell phones. Everyone in Africa has access, not everyone, but at least 70% of people in Africa have access to a phone. It could be a small phone like the Nokia phone that is uh, being shown in that picture there. So MCC has come up with a, an innovative way of making sure that women, men, boys and girls can access extension information, COVID prevention information, as well as any other information they may require on market prices on their phones, in their homes. And of course, they don't have to meet people. They don't have to put themselves to risk. They have to do it in safe environments. To the far right is Namchura from Tukana in Kenya. She is holding a bank card. Amos spoke about inflation and the challenge with seeds. How do we ensure that people can access those seeds? And how do we ensure that people can survive in, an, in a place where climate change is taking a toll, chronic droughts are taking a toll, and of course inflation is taking a toll. MCC is reaching to people through cash transfers using the banks. So people are receiving bank cards, and then through those bank cards, MCC conveniently deposits money into the, uh, uh, the cash, into their bank accounts, and people are able to access the resources they need in a way that protects them from COVID. We're also grateful in all the work that we're doing on MCC, that MCC is also prioritizing uh, health and hygiene in all food security projects. Uh, in addition, health hygiene kits are also being given to women. And in the recent days, there's also been investment in hand washing uh, facilities that use locally available material and are easy to make. Yes, because the challenge of gathering water and walking long distances to water sources is indeed faced by women. How then can MCC come up with innovative solutions that will ensure that water is used carefully? To the far right, you see what you call a tip tap, just a container and three sticks 
can help you come up with a technology that indeed can make a difference in the lives of women through judicious use of water. And believe us, when we say thank you for your support, this is what we mean. Coming up with innovative technologies that are low cost, but can make a significant difference in the lives of people. And not to say that everything MCC is doing is successful. No, not at all. Not even close. But yes, we are making a difference in a small way. Our past gender work is, is now starting to bear fruit. I think Olivia spoke about the gender-based violence that happens as a result of lockdowns. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, MCC was working on gender responsive and transformative approaches that involves teaching men how to cook. This is more like the master chef program in the United States or in Canada. When men learn how to cook, this opens dialogue about gender issues. And in some cases opens opportunities to discuss about how men can build healthy masculinities. Isn't it a marvel to be in a world where men and women can work together, cooking food and sharing it together? And of course, men also owning plates, pans, teapots. Amazing stuff that MCC is doing. So how is this translating post -COVID, uh, in the COVID era? Now what is happening is because of the lockdown, men in some ways have learned how to share responsibilities with their wives. And that is a huge relief for women. Again, as I have said, we are not saying that we have solutions to every problem as a result of COVID, but we want to acknowledge the support that you give us because it is helping us move the needle in just a small way. Thank you so much for your support. We would not be able to do what we do without it. Thank you for all your support. Thank you. And thank you, Belma. Thank you, Pugani another remarkable window into both gender sensitive and, and COVID safe uh, ways. I loved, did you call it a tippy tap? Did yes. I get that right? Yeah, I, I appreciated you saying a bit more about it. The photo did do a good job though of explaining, maybe you could go back to that one. There, there it is. Uh, I see now how the gentleman steps on the lower stick tilts the, the, uh, the water container, so it's a no touch. Um, beautiful. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, um, we have, uh, you know, 15 minutes at least for questions. And um, I, I'm expecting they're going to come in more here. We've got a few already. Um, I'm gonna actually go back to Olivia and, and Amos. Um, you, you named, quite a few discouraging things that are happening in Sudan and South Sudan, you know, nine years of, of independence of a separate country and seven of those having been, you know, significant conflict and war, only four ventilators. Um, you told some, some hopeful stories near the end. Say a little more about uh, what gives you hope in, in uh, quite difficult circumstances now made worse by COVID. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, allow you to draw hope in your work there? Yeah, I think to, to start it with that, <clears throat> To start, it, start with is where uh, Olivia ended. Um, the current support that we're receiving is really going to the people in, who really need it most. The ones in IDP camps, for example, the ones in uh, Unity State that we are currently supporting, they have been there from 2013 when the war uh, started. Some of them ran away into the nearby countries as refugees. They returned, the situation is still the same. And they have, like I said, they just changed status from being refugees to now being IDPs. And they're not seeing a hope of returning soon. So the most important thing that really encourages us is that the food that they're receiving is able to directly, you know, 
help them get a meal, but also this community that were working in was declared uh, to be under famine in 2017. So since that time, all the projections have really emphasized that without humanitarian assistance, it would be very challenging and these communities would relapse into uh, uh, famine. So that assistance is enabling, in, you know, MCC contributing to saving lives, uh, preventing the relapse of famine, improving the food consumption, and also the coping uh, mechanisms of these communities. But also other things that we are doing as MCC in South Sudan, uh, for example, enhancing a position of skills for survival, like we uh, noted the case of a woman who got uh, a tailoring machine, a sewing machine. This is very important for her because it enables her to get income, and this income is enabling you know, her to feed her family, uh, be able to take kids uh, when, for example, the schools were open, they were able to pay them to go to school. Uh, when they needed uh, health care, she was able to get that uh, money from, you know, repairing other people's clothes and making uniforms for the students in the schools to be able to, you know, take them to the health center and be able to receive the treatment. Because, uh, like we said, only 22% of the health facilities are functional currently. So the coverage of the health coverage is actually too low. So when people are able to have this income generating activity, especially the women, because uh, the current focus, uh, for example, in that um, program is for the widows and the women held in the households. And in the food, we are focusing, for example, the uh, child headed households, like you saw in the photo of kids carrying food. There are many kids of that kind who are actually heading their own households and taking care of their siblings. So together, this uh, encourages us and encourages the people that we serve. Also, for example, in the education uh, support, we are able to support other projects, for example, like school feeding. And this in a real sense devises the, the children's attendance in the project's enrollment. At the moment, they are not able to go to, to school because of COVID, but we know when they resume, they will equally still need uh, this food so, so, so much. And this really continues to encourage us because through the MCC support, they're able to get food, the teachers are able to be trained, because quite a number of them uh, uh, still have quite inadequate uh, skills to be able to uh, effectively deliver the, the lessons that the kids need. And uh, also at the other level, we are supporting, for example, peace building projects. And these are enabled people, enabling people to reconcile. Because for a long time, uh, like we said, seven out of the nine years of existence, there has been a civil war. There has not been peace. So in the communities, they are able to, through the support that MCC is giving, their, their activities, for example, like dialogues, like the nitro forums, the trainings, they're able to get the skills to enable them reconcile. They're able to get platforms that they need to be able to talk to one another. They're able to get the skills that they need for encouraging one another, but also be able to address issues of, for example, trauma and mental health related issues that are so prevalent and for which the support is inadequate. So this okay, encourages so us. Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that even in a, a webinar on food and food crisis, you brought in a peace message there that is a, a critical one for us to hear. Uh, I know Thelma wanted to speak to this question too, and now there are other questions pouring in. Uh, but Thelma, the hope question to you. For, for, for me and Thelma, our hope comes from the fact that we know that when we go out to meet communities struggling on their knees without water, without food, we have a group of supporters that are behind us, that are cheering for us, that are praying for us, and that are giving generously to help us reach out to those people. We feel like we are a bridge that connects the donors and the communities that need help. And because of that, we have a lot of joy and we keep going. 
Thank you. Some of those people are with us today. I'm sure they are. Uh, another Can question. Can I just add something about Olivia? Please, Olivia, go ahead. Yes, I I wanted to say something. I wanted to say something that one 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 of the things that has given me hope in working in South Sudan is the resilience of the people. Mm. Amidst all the challenges that they've gone through, like when you go through the communities, you find they celebrate very few, very small successes. And when they, when they see that things are good, they celebrate, they tell you peace is coming, things are okay. Like there's that confidence that, they give you that confidence to keep going. They, they never give up. These are people who can literally squeeze gold out of sand. That's one thing I really love about South Sudan, the resilience of the people. Mm. They do not give up. Olivia, can you say that again? Who can squeeze? <laughs> I, I want to not yeah, lose they, that. Yeah. Can you just repeat that? They can squeeze gold out of sand. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you for being the messenger that helps us hear that powerfully Hello. encouraging story. Wow. Uh, Thelma, uh, a question for you. Someone's asking about even though the pandemic is having horrific. I didn't get, I didn't, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, this is a question for Thelma. Um, someone has said that even though the pandemic has had such negative, uh, caused such harm in so many communities, is there a possibility that there will be positive innovations, long-lasting positive outcomes that, that uh, might come of this? And others might answer too, but I, I wondered if Thelma, you had a comment. For me, I would say we have already started seeing some of the positive things. Women often struggle walking long distances to go fetch water. And more often than not, that's how they spend their day, going up and down the road trying to fetch water. But seeing people use water very conservatively, knowing that this is how they can protect themselves from COVID is a big breakthrough in it in itself. And also seeing men participate in that process of fetching water, participate in making food, that alone is building families in ways that we had not imagined and moving the cultural needle too. So we are very grateful for the opportunities that are coming out of this very disparate situation. Yeah, you had some you had some remarkable images earlier uh, that you know pointed at some of the things you've just named more more clearly now. Um, is there anyone else who wanted to speak to this notion of positive coming out of out of something quite difficult and painful? Fugeni. Yes, I would talk about the collaboration that we now have to what to do with the police. Uh, the aspect of building in peace building, uh, the fact that people now are forced to stay together, even if they would not want to, the, the situation just forces them to stay together. So all this is actually helping us come up with new working arrangements that in some ways will be uh, culturally evasive and can cause harm, but also can in some ways influence uh, things that are really good and useful. As an example, uh, when we, sh we shared slides about people working together in the fields uh, because of uh, the need to work in smaller groups, people are now more keen to work together collaboratively as families because that is the only source of income they have because they can't go to work anymore because of the pandemic. But at the same time, it's quite transform transformative to see men staying and working together with their wives rather than going to the city or going to look for casual work. So in some ways we see that. And at MCC level two, MCC is now coming up with different ways of working that are more exciting and that are also innovative. For example, this webinar, traditionally MCC would go for a large gathering and here we are today on this platform. So in some ways the good can also come out of this situation. Yes, we too are attentive to people's safety during these times. And 
And I'm so grateful that people are availing themselves of, of these new offerings. It's one thing for us to, to put them out and, and have you four uh, excellent colleagues presenting, but uh, for people also to choose to be part of this, you're right, this is another example of the pivoting that, that we're all being asked to do. Um, we've only got a few moments left. Um, you know, I, I actually wanted to drill into one other uh, thing you talked about. Uh, about cash transfers using phones and using using cards. You know, we've known about that for a long time. I, I don't know if this translates over to South Sudan. Um, we've known that this kind of technology is is moving ahead for, for many people in the places you're working. What kind of advances are happening there? Is this, is this a speeding up process compared to before? Um, or is is this something that's moving kind of at the same pace it's always been? Uh, thanks, Rick, for that question. I think what we see is that there is a speeding up of the process. Uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, with cash transfers has been that uh, traditionally people were very um, kind of skeptical about whether the cash is going to be used for food. Uh, more often donors are also not very sure if the cash uh, is going to land in the hands of women. Uh, this is why you see that instead of giving real cash to people, in the project uh, case study that I used, MCC gave a bank card. And that bank card uses biometrics. And the fingerprint that can unlock the bank card is the lady's fingerprint, is the woman's fingerprint. So when, when I was in Kenya, in Tukana, where this technology was being piloted by MCC, I asked women exactly the same question to say, do you think this should be scaled up or do you think this should not? The lady said, this should definitely be scaled up. And I said, why? She said, because now if my husband wants money for beer, I can give him the bank card. And I couldn't understand what she meant. So I said, can you clarify? And she says, well, he can have the card, but he doesn't have my finger. So he doesn't have my fingerprint. He will never get the money. So there was a sense of security and a sense of accountability. And to me, I really think these are some of the most innovative ways to protect women and to also reach out to people using less resources because it's cost efficient. And yes, it should be scaled up. And we see a trend where this technology is now really being scaled up big time by other organizations. Hey, thank you for that. Um... Excellent, excellent vignette that, that helps us get a deeper glimpse again. Hey, we're almost at the top of the hour and uh, we wanna take a moment to thank you again, all, all four of our presenters, uh, Amos and Olivia in Uganda and South Sudan and Juba and uh, Thelma and Fugeni coming to us from Winnipeg. Um, I, I love these webinars, I get to host them. Uh, it's a much deeper uh, personal dive into, uh, into our own work, so I'm so grateful. Thank you also to our many participants on uh, Facebook Live and on, on uh, Zoom. We want to invite you to come back uh, on the 11th of August. We're going to do this again. Uh, we're going to look into the work that MCC is doing with Indigenous communities here in Canada. We call it our Indigenous Neighbors Program. Uh, this is an important part of us uh, rebuilding and working at reconciliation with the first peoples, the communities who welcome settlers here to Canada. And in the meantime, we also have a podcast offering that is uh, becoming uh, another way that we're communicating during these times. It's called Relief Development and Podcast, and it's available wherever you find your podcast. And this month, uh, we're interviewing Mennonite comedian Matt Falk, and we're also going to be hearing from a partner in Syria. Her name is Rima, and she's going to tell her story about how they found joy amidst danger when a bomb fell nearby during a craft workshop. So that's Relief Development and Podcast, an ongoing podcast from MCC, and then on the 11th of August, back here again for another MCC webinar, this time on Indigenous Neighbors. So. We are grateful for your participation. We are grateful your, for your prayers, your volunteer efforts, uh, your financial contributions. Just remember when, uh, when Pugani and Thelma's, Thelma's friend in uh, Turkana 
goes with her card to get a, a, a transfer. That's a possibility only because of gifts from, from supporters like you. So we are deeply grateful. Glad you were with us and uh, may you have a very rich rest of your day. Thank you.